2 o'clock here on a beautiful Sunday. We're starting to get the hang of this here Facebook Live thing. Look, I'm not squished. Look, we're the right uh, orientation. So uh, today we're going to have a special Sunday afternoon with our historian because we're going to sit and see our new home uh, 2022 here in the Depew Canal House, the Depew Tavern. But first, I just want a few words. Let's remember, everybody, when you're outside, stay a mule's width apart. If you're walking on our wonderful uh, Five Locks Walk, we've had an uptick of people, over a thousand people a week using this National Historic Landmark Trail uh, right here. And uh, as we say, I love that sign. But really, we're here to talk about this building right here. And this is the 1797 Depew Tavern. This building was built in 1797 by Simeon Depew and Arietta, his wife. Uh, it's hard to read up there, but there's a stone above that middle window that gives the A.D. 1797. Simeon and his wife. Simeon was one of the prominent citizens in High Falls. Uh, he was a farmer. He was a miller. He had, and I think it was 1810, some $5,000 worth of property. That was real money in 1810, folks. Uh, and I'm standing in what, after 1850, would have been the D&H Canal. Maybe we'll take a minute here. This is beyond, we'll, we'll do another, either Where Is Our Historian or Sunday Afternoon here on the Five Locks Walk. But at least you can see Lock 20, well, excuse me, Lock 16. I spent all day shooting the 20 yesterday. We're standing in what would have been the canal bed. And after 1850, this was the side of the canal. But this building was there before the canal. Simeon and his son Jacob operated a tavern and uh, worked for the canal company. Famously, Simeon not only worked for the canal company, but he also sued them for damages uh, and, and actually got some money for it. Uh, interesting to see all the, 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 the way things fit together back in that day. Uh, but then this building, in March 12, 1850, Jacob Depew, his father, Simeon, had died in 1836. We'll talk a little bit more about the chronology inside the house and what happened when. But, uh, 18... excuse me, I was talking about 1850. March 12, 1850, Jacob is sick with a serious rupture. He doesn't think he's going to survive. So he sells real estate in the High Falls area for $20,000 for the G&H Canal Company, including this building. A lot of money, but it was a lot of property. It included his father's mill down by the Roundout Creek, uh, and it, of course, included this building. So after 1850 until 1898, this building was offices in a tavern run by the G&H Canal Company. One, one little thing that we'll point out, we'll talk about a little more when we're inside. My wonderful... Uh, I just want to point this out from here. This is an 1827 edition. I'll talk about that more when we're on the inside. But you can see here it even had a separate entrance here. The cutout. I suppose I should then point out, since we've got this sign right here, uh, in December of 2014, when I was president of the Canal Society, the Open Space Institute, New York State Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation rented us what wound up being $800,000, and that uh, uh, resulted in December 1st, 2015, Open Space Institute purchasing this building for us as a home for our new museum and a visitor center and uh, welcome center here in High Falls, due to open in uh, 2022, spring of 2022, about two years from now. But let's get a look at the house, since that's really the, uh, the point. I should point out that all of this uh, video will be on our YouTube channel. You can find it on our Facebook page if you like us, uh, d &H Canal Facebook page. And we're putting up uh, a lot of content, two different videos, plus this live, and all of this will also be on the, on the YouTube channel. If you would, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it would be great because if we get 100 people within a month's time, we'll have our own URL and it'll make it easy for you good folks to find all of this video. And this is a very common style of building 
Uh, this is a good old Dutch building. These are uh, separated Dutch doors. We believe to be the original doors from 1797. But then you had a center hall. You had fireplaces on either end, and you have this beautiful stairway. Wouldn't, wouldn't pass current code muster, but we get to keep it because it's just too beautiful. Don't know if we can let the public up and down in there at all. Close this just for a So here we are in the center hall. So what a tavern in the 18th century. Let's go over here. Taverns, uh, taverns were places where people would go for meals and where they would stay. And this is one of the big public rooms. This is a room where you would have your meals. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they'd move everything out of the way and they'd pull out beds and you would sleep here your own uh, bathroom or any of that. In fact, everybody used a, uh, an outhouse here until well into the 20th century, if you can imagine. But this room here was the tavern room. These beautiful built-ins are original from 1797. You know, it's really wonderful that the state of New York and Open Space saw the value in this project. This building probably would have gone to somebody who probably wouldn't have been as nice about the interior as we're going to be. It's, it has an amazing amount of historic integrity. Uh, I probably in the fractions of a percent of a building this old, uh, most of them were going to be remodeled, we like to say, but this is pretty much, I mean, obviously the paint is new, but what you're seeing, we know the, the windows are replacements. It originally had, I think, was it two over two? Can't remember, but uh, Neil Larson, our excellent historic consultant on this building, uh, uh, tells us in details like that. But that's how we know that this woodwork was actually original. And this is going to be the home for our new museum. You're in where the Canal Museum will be in, in 2022. And we're, we're still looking good, COVID notwithstanding. Got a great, great bunch of people working really hard, really committed. Uh, there's been very generous, and you can too. You can join the Canal Society. You can donate on any one of our platforms. Uh, and uh, hopefully you can come visit us someday. So tavern life, huh? Uh, so, yeah, the, I was talking about the fact that you can get your own room. You also shared beds. And this has started all sorts of ugly rumors, but in fact it was just, you had the accommodations you had, if somebody else had to be in the bed with you, that's what it was. If not, not, none of that's that. Some of you people got a dirty mind, you know that? So, Simeon and his family operated a tavern here, and Simeon by 1810 had five slaves. That's right, slavery in New York State, in fact, uh, the Hudson Valley was particularly bad. Uh, there's a great a great video called Where Slave uh, The Dutch were, were big in the slave business and the Dutch had sway in the Hudson Valley well into the 19th century. Uh, and in fact, we New York slavery, but you know, we were. But yes, there were five black people who at, at various times, in fact, sometimes I track some of them are now free but still living here. In 1830, interestingly enough, I find a family of free blacks by 1828, all State were free. Um, but, so in the 1830s, the family uh, with the name Depew, it's highly likely that those people were in fact the enslaved, the people that were owned by the Depew family. And we'll talk about where they may have lived when we get to that part of the uh, of thing. So here we people would come in, as I say, you'd have your meals, a wonderful fire. Um, successfully as a tavern, but then something happens in 1825, the Works Brothers start a company to build a canal to move PA coal, that's the whole point of this thing, right, the d &H canal, um, and at that point in time, this was probably, a, it's probably the only tavern in this area at the time, when the canal coming through, it actually gets uh, busier. In fact, so much so, in 1827, oh, there you go. Okay. I was missing for a minute. Oh, <laughs> where was I? 1827. 1827. There we go. Um, Arietta dies, and we have five dollars for a tombstone. Uh, uh, Simeon purchases two stones, tombstones for five dollars a piece. I live next door to the uh, to the cemetery, and I pass by Simeon and Arietta's graves uh, quite frequently when I walk my dog. Uh, boy, dogs are getting lots of exercise these days, huh? <laughs> um, they must just love this. They don't understand the pandemic, do they? So, 1827, 1820, right, 27, yeah, Simeon deeds 
the building to his son Jacob. Um, now, Simeon actually lives another decade, and, and I have Michael Lynch, Lynch who, uh, his mom, Dottie Lynch, helped in this house. She was an antique dealer. Michael uh, worked here, helped, uh, he dug out the basement for chefs on fire. Uh, he went into the history business. He's an architect and a historian, and I, I credit Michael, thank you so much. He works for the State Historic Preservation Office. We're fortunate Michael is actually our contact. All of the work we do in the offices, anything we do in the historic building has to be um, first run past them and okay. We're all on the same page there. We want to keep this historic gem for the community uh, moving forward. We wouldn't want to do anything that would in any way damage the historic integrity. So 1828, um, Jacob now owns it, and Jacob builds, and I thank Michael Lynch for this, we always wonder, he builds this edition. And so this is the first edition, built in 1828. And we know from the historic record that, uh, that Jacob had a, a, a store, a dry goods business, and so we think he ran his store out of here, and he actually was in business with one of his brother-in-laws. And... As is typical of, um, of contracts of the day, their agreement named, I think it was three prominent citizens to be arbitrators. If there was any sort of problems, um, instead of going and taking them to court, there were arbitrators in the, uh, in the contract. And within his brother-in-law had some sort of problem, and they initiate it. So what does Jacob do? He starts a business with his other brother-in-law. I always wonder what holidays were like in the Depew household at that time. No indication whether these were hostile or whatever. But uh, so this part of this becomes a store. That's why I wanted to point out this is that window. This was a, a separate entrance completely. What we have right here is the original door. You know, I love to show this little detail, people. There's this little wonderful hand brought hook. But look at what does it take? How long did it take? to wear that groove there. Isn't that amazing? But this here, it's just, uh, I'm going to have to put on my woodworker's thing sometime to fix this door. The original door um, from 1797, we're pretty sure, the strap hinges and the like. If somebody's like, repairing the tape, we'll have to do something about that at some point. You can help, you know, donate. We, we, we can use that. But, you know, it's tough times, we understand. Uh, people have been very generous. So, and interestingly enough, this was the one way upstairs, what we call a servant stair. That was the only way upstairs um, was through here. So, gee, if this was a store, how did they get goods and stuff in? I'll show you a little later on in this, uh, in this little Facebook Live. By the way, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. So the Canal Company buys this building in 1850, and for the next 45 years, this is all, uh, 48 years, this is offices, this is a store. In fact, we know that uh, two Torligers, I'm assuming they're brothers, I haven't had a chance to chase them down. Uh, they rented this from the Canal Company for at least the first two years. Uh, one of the things I'm having a hard time with as a historian is finding enough information about what went on when the Canal Company owned this. There's very little information. These ceiling beams here, Robert, were actual replacements. These came from a barn at Stone Dock. Thank you, Francis, for that information. Francis O'Donnell used to work at the, uh, at the, the, the golf course at Stone Dock Road. Um, you can see, it's going to be hard for you out there in, in, in the land, you can see the ghost of the original beams. These beams were put in in the late 1960s when the famous, famous chef and restaurateur John Novi bought the building for $4,500. But now I'm way ahead of my story, aren't I? By the way, you folks who remember this, this was the bar room right here. This will become the tavern room in our new museum, and this is where we'll set it up like a tavern. We want to sort of immerse you in the, in the era, and we'll talk about the various personalities, about what black people on the canal, about immigrants. Do you know the D&H Canal could not have been built without Im immigrants, largely Irishmen? The D&H Canal could not have been run without immigrants. If I could ever figure out how to get the whole thing to work, and I will, one of these uh, Sunday afternoons on a rainy one, maybe, I'll do my PowerPoint presentation on the marginalized population of the d and we'll talk about blacks, immigrants, women, and children. I'm also working on an article on the subject that will eventually be up on our website. We'll have a new website um, up by the end of this month, uh, and we'll be locking in. You'll be able to go and find all these videos, and we'll put up 
a lot of our historic pictures will be available to the public. Uh, and uh, we'll also have various articles. Dr. Powell has just written a wonderful article about the other um, materials and goods shipped in the DNA canal. It wasn't just the coal canal people. For the Bridgeline Historical Society, with Dr. Powell's permission, we'll put up his articles as well. I've probably got three or four or five that'll get up there. And, uh, um, and you know, you historians, we're happy to hear from you. So here we were, and, and this probably functioned more as a store, but it is a nice big open room. And when we get upstairs, you'll see how some of those rooms function. You know, every time I'm in this building, and I've been in and out of this building for the last, well, we got it in 2000, for five years now, I love this building. It always just, just really just uh, uh, warms my historian's heart. We're very fortunate, and the community's fortunate. This is going to be, uh, the, the, the hamlet of High Falls will be transformed. The town has, um, has taken a 19-year lease on Brady Park, where we have our, our, um, our flea market, and where old lots 17 and 18 are. Uh, that's going to connect. There's trail connections down by the water. Uh, we're trying to make a loop trail on the box walk. Two to five years, the, the Hamlet of High Falls is going to be hopping. We're going to have a welcome center here. Uh, I think people are really going to be happy with how this town is transformed. Uh, will be the third great wave. The canal really put High Falls on the map. John Novi put it on the map. Gets four stars in, I forget what year, I'd have to check my notes now, from Craig Claiborne of the New York Times. He was such an innovative chef, so I always like to say he put this canal on the, he put this building on the map in this town in the same way the canal did. But I, I, I predict that the town of Marble Town, the High Falls Conservancy, the Civic Association, all the stakeholders, and the Canal Society are going to really make a, a huge mark and really improve this town. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but uh, it'll just be even better. And I, I should say, since we're talking about High Falls, welcome Courtney, Courtney McNamara, who's my editor and our curatorial assistant, recent graduate from Johns Hopkins Online uh, uh, in digital curation, big help. But she just moved to High Falls, so she's now a High Falonian. <clears throat> you know, the Civic Association used to call this the center of the universe. And Father Divine, that's a whole story we'll have to get into some other time, Father Divine, <clears throat> he called it the promised land. And he owned a lot of the real estate in, in this area here. But let's go and look at a little more of the building. This is a wonderful opportunity. Most people don't get to get into this building. Uh, occasionally we open it up. We're getting ready to start doing the interior work. You can kind of tell that it needs some work. We need to paint, we need to, we'll be, we'll, we'll be looking into contracts for the heat, HVAC, more or less. But let's go on over here. Oops, doors. This was the original kitchen for John Noni. Uh, there's speculation that it was the birthing room, but certainly I, I, would, I can't speak to that definitively. But uh, it, it became the dishwashing room after John and friends of his built uh, the addition on the back in his uh, award-winning kitchen. He got an award in the, I think it was 84, for the best uh, kitchen ad adaptation in a historic house. He did a very sensitive job. A shout out to John for, for maintaining, for being a steward of this building uh, until we could get it. Uh, it's just a boon for the entire community, isn't it? You can see we got some storage. This room needs the floor up, needs the roof down. We're going to start that work as soon as uh, New York State will let contractors come back in. Uh, we are not letting any of this slow us down. A lot of nonprofits have got uh, difficulties, but we've got a very, very sophisticated smart board who have, uh, who have assured that we will survive this. And I couldn't be proud of the, 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 our president, Peter Beanstock, our vice president, Alan Boundary, Sally Schultz. Happy birthday, Sally, our wonderful treasure. Uh, I should go on and on. I should uh, maybe a little later. So this would have been in the early period. The family lived here with their slaves. They managed uh, businesses, farming, the mills. Uh, but the family also lived here in these, these smaller rooms. And we'll take a look at another one, but it's too dangerous to go that way. Let's go around this way. The smaller rooms were, at least for the first 20, probably 30 years, um, were also private rooms for the family. We try to set it up a little bit with some material culture of the era, but at, at various times there have been more pictures up on the wall. I didn't, uh, I didn't do anything here yet. I thought it might be nice for people to see what we're working with, and then they can come visit our new museum in two years. 
and, uh, and see what we've done with it. But you will still get a very strong sense of this building because we will in no way um, do anything to anything historic. But this would have been a private family room, be a comfortable room that you probably have, somebody must have slept here in the cold winters. You know, this building didn't have any heat or electricity until John Nobody got this in 1966. And this was apartments between 1935 and 1946. Three families, no running water, no electricity. Still use the outhouse out back. There also used to be a, a well, just a, it might even be the one that's encased by the, the new building in the back, that all the locals used for their water. So this would have been a private room, uh, family room. But after 1830, uh, both all members of the family, Jacob DePew was renting Bruce's uh, uh, farm, uh, and Simeon DePew had built a house the other side of the falls, up on sort of High Falls Heights, if you will. Ooh, I just, I just made a new name. High Falls Heights. Let's sit down. Uh, so at that point in time, I think it was probably the canal has come through now. 1827, there's already boats coming past here. The whole canal opens up in 1828. Uh, and things really start to, to hop here in High Falls. Uh, originally, the canal passed about 50 foot the other side of Route 213. It's not until the final enlargement of 1850 that it passes directly in front of the house. Um, this was what we got it to, probably one of the most, I, I would say it was the only, um, certainly the most significant of the canal era, canal related buildings in private hands. A, another good reason why we're proud and, and happy that Open Space Institute and New York State Department of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation saw the importance of this project and funded us. So now let's go upstairs. Watch your step. These are not, these are not uh, by any sort of current code. Any questions? Or? Nothing yet. Yeah, these are a little narrower, a little higher than current code would allow. Our current plans won't have you upstairs, so this, this will be, you'll have, to have, you'll have to know somebody to get up here. We might eventually get a lift in here. But um, on the short term, for phase one of our plans, the museum will be in those uh, the rooms downstairs. So here we've got another one of the private rooms. This is where Simeon and Arietta, his second wife Rachel, who he marries after Arietta passes in 27, he's 69 years old, <laughs> the old codger. Uh, in this room had a feature, now it, it, it's this, this door here, from what we can tell, this was just a way to close off and make these two rooms a little bigger, which would have been handy, especially when it was no longer a private residence. But I shouldn't say, after 1850, at least one lock tender stayed here, and I think there might have been the lock tender for lock 15 probably stayed here as well. Um, the only other lock on this side of Roundabout Creek. And in fact, into the 20th century, because this section of the canal did hold water. Uh, and in fact, east of here held water till 1916 at least. And George Switzer, who buys this building in 1898 for $770, he runs a, a tobacconist and a confectionery, but he also operates locks for, um, for Samuel Kirkendall's cement efforts. He operates the locks over uh, the other side of the rundown. So I guess he'd have to get up in the morning and walk down the towpath, walk across one of the aqueducts, and go to work. Um, so this was this functioned as a as a lock tender's residence from 1850 on. It saved the company the uh, the expense of building uh, a separate residence. And, and, and this what appears to be a closet, but I think was a way to make bigger rooms when you wanted them. We're seeing the back of some 20th century construction. There was bathrooms put in there uh, when Mr. Novi finally got the building. This will all be coming down soon. We've gotten, I believe, if we haven't gotten permission for Shippo. We should be getting it momentarily. Uh, and this is some of the work that we'll be doing, the plastering, painting, uh, putting in new electric. Um, it, 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 like so many things, they started out small and then just kept adding boxes. I think that counted, is it eight breaker boxes in the basement? Oh, whatever. Uh, most of them disconnected because we felt they were a fire hazard. Just some beautiful millwork there that then Teal should be showing you there for a minute. Little chimney cupboards on the side. Again, we believe all of this dates from the historic period. Well, not the speaker volume control or the, uh, or the plug, but the actual woodwork. 
these uh, chimney cupboards, so-called in the antiques trade, because of these big narrow cupboards that were next to chimneys. And here we have an original 1797 chimney cupboard. Beautiful paint. This outdoor paint, uh, outdoor paint would be stuff that uh, probably Dottie Lynch helped um, Mr. Nobi. I don't know that anybody's done a historic paint analysis. We're trying to, we'll need to have that done as part of the next phase, because if we do repaint, we're, we're going to want to know what the original colors were, and we will then attempt to replicate that. And let's just go over to the other side. Now, it's not clear. Again, we're still in the 1797 building. Here is the upstairs room. And in the historic period, until actually the middle of the 20th century, this was one big long room from one end of the building to the other end. This skin wall, 20th century skin, pretty sure this is just going to go. Um, certainly we're, we're running it by Shippo, I can't imagine they'll, they'll have us keep it. It'll be nice once again to be able to interpret this room was another public room. Uh, that would have functioned very similarly to that first room that we went into, that first big long room. At some point, this were bedrooms in the 20th century. My notes are downstairs, but I have to, I know Mary Van Lair walked through here and talked about her childhood when she and her family lived here. And there were two other families. I haven't committed their names to memory. If anybody wants to know, they can email me or ask, and we'll check on the notes when we're downstairs again. We're very lucky. There's very little electricity in the building, so a lot of rooms don't have light. We couldn't have done this if it was like uh, books of the week, if, if we didn't have the sunlight we've got today. What a beautiful day, too, huh? 77 degrees. We were really all, uh, all hoping for a little nice weather, weren't we? So here we go through here. And we've got this little narrow opening. This is fascinating because today you access the second floor of that 1827 edition. But this entrance that you're about to walk through was put in after Mr. Novi bought this, sometime in the late 60s or early 70s. Prior to that, the only way stuff came up was that narrow little stair that we showed you, right down here, blocked off because it's a little dangerous when this was public. Famously, my, uh, my president talks about he actually nicked his Achilles tendon, tendon uh, in a party up here on his birthday. His birthday coming up this month, too, by the way, Peter. Um, so at the moment, this is blocked off. We've just left that there. From Probably that went up right after Peter uh, earned his tendon, right? Um, yeah, you know, uh, OSHA didn't exist then. You didn't have building inspectors. And so these sorts of stairways, these little narrow curving stairways are always referred to as servant stairs. And indeed, in large households that had servants or slaves, there were the back stairs that the public wouldn't see. In this building, it's hard to say. There is signs that there was a stairway uh, in the center room. We haven't really parsed that. I'll have to talk to Neil Larson, our historic consultant, about that. But I wanted to show you this other thing, and that is the door to nowhere. Yeah. So this is a, an original door from 1827. Um, now today, well, maybe we'll go out and take a look at that if we have time. But the time does fly, doesn't it, people, you know? I could just sit and talk about the D&H Canal for hours, right? Um, this is the roof of a, an addition that the canal company put on in 1860s sometime, or at least it was on by then. So that doorway was no longer functional. But we all think that this doorway existed to get supplies up. When, when Jacob and his brother-in-laws had their business here, this was the way that they could bring stuff up because that, that whole hole did, uh, did not exist. And this room has a bigger version of what I talked about on the other side. This room, big open room if you needed it, but if you needed, if somebody wanted a, 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 a more privacy, you could close up and have two smaller rooms as well. Uh, probably Mr. Nobi at various times kept it open or closed, depending on if people wanted, uh, wanted, wanted uh, privacy or not. There's a famous story, I'll get it wrong, but on April Fool's Day, John Lennon and Yoko Ono made a, uh, made a reservation. Nobody believed him because it was, April, it was April Fool's Day. But don't you know, 
John and Yoko actually had dinner here when John Novi ran this restaurant. I'm trying to collect stories of the time under Mr. Novi because it's part of the history of the house and part of the story we'll be telling. Uh, and he had a, 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 a huge effect on, on cuisine. He was called the father of the new American cooking. He also, there was a lot of people, he was very popular. This was a place that drew people to this area. Um, Cousin Brucey, the famous uh, um, radio DJ. Cousin Brucey's on our advisory board. He and his wife Jody, lovely people, generous, and uh, um, love to tell stories. They, they bought a stone house in this area because they used to come here for dinner. And so when they heard that the Canal Society was, uh, had gotten this building, they clamored to, to come and help us. And they're now part of our, our advisory board, along with people like Nina Smiley from the Mohawk Mountain House, uh, um, Kevin Draley. Kevin Draley is one of the most famous sommeliers in the world, gets paid mondo bucks. Kevin got his start. He, he was at the Windows of the World. He's written the Windows of the World uh, wine books. Um, Kevin tells stories. I've got to get Kevin on video somewhere in here. Kevin actually stayed here and lived, and he learned about wine in this building. But, you know, while we're on this side, so all of this stuff that you're seeing, the wall, this is all later. This was Donnie Lynch um, helping Mr. Novi out. This is not anything original or based on what was in the house, but just what she knew to be typical of the era. But let's go for a minute. I hope my wife does my camera person, Kelly, my lovely, talented, and ever patient wife. <laughs> I'm not going to take her up this crazy stair because I want to show you a little fascinating thing. We'll, we'll do the other. Adam, watch your head here, dear. We've lost it. So what you're looking at right here, people, is a wall that was encased 30, after, 30 years after it was built. So when this edition was added in 1827, this is like a time capsule, people. You want to know how they pointed stone in 1797? This is the original pointing. This is, I believe, and I have to ask Mr. Novi to know for sure, the original red paint. I can't imagine why anybody would have painted it after this. This attic was just storage space. Um, but isn't that amazing? I think this is a, an important little historical time capsule. At various times, by the time there's photographs, instead of red on those gable ends, it's white paint that we see usually. And you might notice these beams and stuff. We're going to go to the other part of the attic uh, uh, in a couple minutes. These were put in when we did the roof two years ago. The, uh, the architect and engineer made a compelling case that this roof, do you know that they have to plan for a greater snow load today because of global warming uh, than, than they used to? We had to put on bigger gutters than we thought we needed. This was put to support this roof. I think that George, who's a, we have a lot of High Polonians. George, I'm going to forget your last name, but the engineer lives here in High Falls. Rick uh, Alfandre, our current architect, lives in High Falls. Christina Ferorda lives here in High Falls as well as New York City. She's our exhibit designer along with her partner Paul Orselli. We're very excited about the plans, about the new museum that they're helping us design. Uh, it's really going to be a lot of fun, folks. You're all going to want to go multiple times. And we also hope to be open uh, more often. Uh, we'll go back. We would have actually just been opening for the season yesterday if it weren't for COVID. We are like so many small historical societies currently uh, weekends May through October. But in two years' time, we intend to be open uh, at least five days a week, possibly more. At least that's the plan for now. But this is a spot that very few people are going to get to go into. You're going to have to know somebody like me <laughs> to be able to see these things. A little foreshadowing now. My wife's going to show you the, uh, the 1797 attic. You can see some of that. But I, I, I want to at least take us up the stairs because I'll talk a little bit more about what, uh, what we can glean of the history of the house. If anybody out there ever sees anything about the, this building under the canal company, please let me know. Um, I find very few mentions and I, I hoard them when I get them. I've written an article on the history of this house. Uh, that'll also get put up uh, on our uh, website sometime before the month is out. And I've done a PowerPoint presentation on the topic that once I work out how Facebook Live Together. So you might have noticed last week, folks, I looked skinnier. That's because Facebook took my laptop and just squished me. I liked that I was skinnier, but I didn't like that the pictures had been compressed. Uh, at some point, the Carroll Collection, which isn't scanned in yet, will be put up probably as its own freestanding 
uh, archive on our website, but that may be later in the year. So much to do. But let's, uh, let's carefully make our way back downstairs. I don't know, do we want to show the Question, people? question. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bob Booth wants to know, were those stones taken from the area or shipped in? Oh, the stones were all local. We were very close to St. Joseph, where they had a lot of uh, the Shoendung conglomerate. Um, there are two or three or four flooded quarries within a quarter mile of here. Uh, some of them are cement rock, but a lot of them are also just limestone. And in fact, I'll bet you a lot of the limestone that was used for these limestone buildings is the same dolomitic limestone that makes natural cement. So this is all local stone, and I think that's pretty typical. Certainly in the construction of the canal, we see different kinds of material, like somewhere near the rivers, you'll see lots of river stone lining the bed of the canal. Um, please tune in for our Where is Our Historian series, and you'll get to see extant sections of the D&H Canal, uh, and you'll get me yakking at you, telling you what I think went on there. Most of the time I'm right. Sometimes I speculate. I generally try and tell you when I speculate. I think it's a big sin as a historian. Speculation, we have to do it as historians. You're not, you're, you know, sometimes you're going to sit and not have any proof. But it's important that we be honest and let people know when we're speculating. I could tell story upon story, but I, I'll, I'll spare you that. Now, be very careful here because these new lamb beams made the entranceway here even harder. Must have been great to be a kid in this building, huh? These little stairs and stuff. Boy, I'd have a lot of fun in this attic when I was a youngster. <laughs> uh oh. Looks like we may have lost the. Uh... Okay, there you go. I was trying to show how skinny they were with my feet, but it didn't work. Let me see if I can get it this way. No, nope. too dark. Huh? Too dark. Uh oh, they're going to think we went dark now. Let me just close this. We'll go through here for a minute, but there's not a lot of light here. <clears throat> Probably might as well just to say you've seen the building. This room will be much more light when this wall goes. This is that 20th century. Uh, um, it's not even, it's, it's just the thickness of the product that they use. I'm not even sure it's a manufacturing product of some sort. This is where the bathrooms are. We're going to keep one bathroom here for staff, but this will be opened back up, this other bathroom. Let's take a quick minute look at the other attic. So as you go up these stairs here, I just want to point out, I'm sure that Kelly will show you, the tremendous amount of wear. It's clear that this attic was well used. It's my contention that this is where those five slaves lived. Generally speaking, slaves lived in these uh, marginal parts of your building, basements or attics. The basement only had maybe five foot of head space, which isn't to say they would have been forced to live there, but given the amount of wear, I'm more inclined to think that they lived up here. Uh, and in fact, I can say definitively that the 20th century people lived up here. Remember Kevin Zraeli, the sommelier? Am I pronouncing that right? Oh, well. Um, this was his room. <laughs> so, you know. This one? So, right here, yes. This was, this was Kevin's room, right here. He, he looks at it fondly. Um, some of the wine bottles you might see on the floor, probably Kevin had some. Here's some more over here. Kevin might have something to do with them. Uh, this whole room had some great old wallpaper on it. Some of the boards had to come out when the, uh, when the structural work went up. This was all work that we did went a couple of years ago uh, to, uh, to secure the building when we put the new cedar shake roof on. Uh, this new modern roof looks just like a historic one, but it's much tighter and it's going to enable us to keep the humidity and temperature constant uh, so as to be proper stewards of our collections. Yes, we like to say, uh, Bob, the stories you can tell, it's got walls that can talk. I'll have to get a, a I'll have to memorize some more of the, the stories from, uh, from the restaurant era because there were a lot of famous people that came here. I know, um, uh, Robert De Niro got married here, the, his, the, his current wife. 
Number of rooms in the building, Robert. Uh, uh, well, let's see. We've got... Uh, Seven in the historic building, and then in the 1797, and then another two were added. Depends on how you count them with those room dividers and stuff. Another two were added. Now we're looking out onto Lock 16, built in 1850. This is atypical, folks. That's a cut stone masonry lock. Most of the locks on the DNH were dry laid stone with a oak lining. It's my contention in 1850 they realized how much it cost to renew that oak every five to ten years and they built for more permanency. And again, they had the local stone. And we see these stones, you can notice how many are missing on that left hand side there. People would take these beautiful blocks and repurpose them. The railroad, when they bought the line, would use them for trestles. Um, there were some by the dump that I think the town may be donating to us. Um, but yeah, looking out on lock, lock number 16, I'll have to show you a picture or two when we get back downstairs of, of that lock in the historic era with the building. I don't know about you, but when I look at an old house, I have to go to the attic in the basement. We're not gonna go to the basement today. No light, not enough to see there. And I gotta save something, right? So let's, let's go on down and uh, see what else we can talk about show the good folks. This is an awful lot of usable space up here. I don't imagine in my lifetime we'll need it, but this building's footprint's about 1,500 square foot. Uh, so we have two floors at, at that. And then you've got another 1,500 right up here um, that if we insulated it, which would be a shame because then you couldn't see them, not the skip sheathing. But uh, it's possible it, as the society grows into this century that this could be captured space it could be used for certain kinds of storage, certainly not collection storage, but other kinds of, of, of storage, and, and, and undoubtedly will uh, when we move in two years from now. Very exciting project. I'm so, so happy with the way things have grown. We've been very lucky, but it's because a lot of really great people have, have banded together and have generously given of their time, of their knowledge, of their skills, and of their money. <laughs> and we've needed it all. <laughs> Let's go on downstairs. What do you say? You don't want to see this one? What's that? No. Oh, did you want to show them this room? Of course. Yes. I'm sorry. Can we not go to this room? <laughs> this they is... saw the other side. Again, this was all, it had a door and it was a closed off space. So at least the slaves had a little bit of privacy. I don't know about Kevin though. I'll have to ask him. He's at least extant. But yeah, so here's the other attic room. It's really nice that uh, they did such a great job. Yankee Construction uh, did this work and they built the North Edition. We'll go take a look at it before we close out today. Um, but they did a wonderful job. They were the low bidder by $150,000. But the high bidder, there's no way they would have done any better job than Yankee Construction. We were lucky we knew of them. They were doing work at Historic Huguenot Street. We knew that they had the abilities to work in a historic building. They were wonderful. They really were respectful of the house, and they did a great job. Look at those wonderful marks. Those would be from a broad axe. And I get my woodworker guy thing in. Um, you go and chip, and they take a log, and they chip all these things, and then you'd use an adze to cut these things off. And there's a hand-hewn beam from 1797. These bricks were probably the, for the chimney, Hudson Valley bricks, huge industry. They used D&H coal in the bricks. They found that if you use what they called comb, C-U-L-M, uh, coal dust, uh, that it fired a better brick. So there was a brickyard in Ellenville. So there were some bricks moved on the canal, but not a lot. Um, it was really, the industry was centered all along the Hudson River. Unfortunately, Bob, there were no interesting documents. This building had been completely uh, um, empty with families here. I mean, there's documents I've discovered in the archives of the Ulster County Historical Society. I'm their vice president. And when I was researching this house, I found over 100 documents concerning the Depews. That's where I know this story about his brother-in-laws and the like. That's where I know how much the gravestone cost. 
Uh, a wonderful resource, Ulster, Ulster County Historical Society has been around since, I believe it's 1858. I'm very proud to work with that organization as well. But documents in this house, there were none. Mr. Novi has a lot of DNA stuff that we'd love to buy from him um, that was hung in the house. Um, but as far as uh, documents, there is some writing on that, that door that I've got a document. Uh, I didn't want to, it doesn't move easily. The door on the second floor of the first edition has some notations I've got to document and uh, um, transcribe, figure out what they say, but I'm told there's some historic writing. But otherwise, the building had been a restaurant for 40 years, it had been the lifeblood of Mr. Novi, uh, and it was really pretty much um, of Mr. Novi stuff. And I can show you pictures, people. I was just going through my pictures. Um, there was an awful lot of stuff in here. It's a big building. It's a big, wonderful building with a huge history. Why don't we go down and we'll, we'll wrap this up. Uh, we'll go, go look at the historic North Edition. Maybe talk about that for a minute. Back down these steps. Take your, we're going to have to get a handrail in here. Make sure they get to see everything, Kelly. <laughs> We're very fortunate here in the Hudson Valley, and in the Kingston area in particular, and that we have an awful lot of these beautiful stone buildings from the Dutch era. This is kind of uh, the tail end, I wouldn't say the Dutch, although it's got those Dutch elements, the center hall, the, the, the double door. Well, the center hall was more than a Dutch element, but uh, let's take ourselves down here. your step. Careful now. Shall we show them the kitchen for a minute, the old kitchen? Why not? Why not? And then we'll go, we'll finish up with the North Edition. That's cool. So this is a uh, 1970s edition that uh, Mr. Novi and his friends put, and he put his award-winning kitchen, as I say in the 80s, I think it was 1984. He wins an award for the best adaptation. There was a building behind the canal house here, but it was a freestanding building. It wasn't this salt box-like structure. This is a conceit. This is just something that was built that was the way to save. Well, for instance, if you look over on this side, you can see the exterior wall. This will be a, a visitor center. A welcome center will interpret the many trails that have got DNH remains on them. Um, will be a, a welcome center for people coming to the area. Tourism's our biggest uh, industry here. And uh, this will be an open, open way. We're going to get some of this roof clear. You'll get to see this. But we call this the Roundout Room because the town of Roundout, two or three farms in 1825 when the canal route is announced, becomes a, a city larger than Kingston when it becomes part of Kingston in 1872. Um, but then urban renewal hits in the early 70s, and they destroy tons of wonderful buildings and run out. So all of this brick, a lot of these materials, were salvaged by John Novi when he built his kitchen, and the board likes to refer to this as the roundout room. We're slowly getting it cleaned up. It's going to need a floor. It's going to need some work. There'll be public bathrooms. People really want. They want a good cup of coffee, and they want a free bathroom. That's what we've learned. We're doing our due diligence. We're doing a lot of study. But these bricks have got their own history. They're Hudson Valley bricks that made the town of Roundout in the 19th century. And uh, at least somebody was smart enough to come in and salvage what they could. Oh, and there's the Caskill Brick Company. We've even got the name of one. Good eye. There's a, there's a, a gallery in Caskill, New York. Is it Caskill, New York? Called the Brick, B-R-I-K Gallery. And they have, it's an art gallery. Um, Ulster County has the highest uh, artist per capita in the nation. Um, it's an art gallery, but he has, a, he has the biggest collection of Hudson Valley bricks I have ever seen. It was fascinating. So we're going to get ready to wind up this afternoon. Did you want to go up and show them that? Uh, you got to be careful on that set of stairs. No, it's fine. Um, let's just go and take a look at one more aspect before we call it a day.
Anybody else got a question or anything? No. No. no I'm good. We're constantly doing new research. I've got some histories up on the wall that I have to correct some of it. For some reason, I read somewhere from one of the books, I read that there was a, um, <clears throat> that the peak time for the DNH was 1872, but I can now say definitively it was 1870. In fact, in their annual, annual report of 72, they apologized for not. Um, you know, we started out in front of the house, and here is half of a stereo card showing the canal house. Now, this had a covered bridge at one point, but what you see there now is an iron truss bridge. Squire Whipple, one of the first graduates of Union College's civil engineering program in the early 1840s, designed those bridges for the Erie Canal, and they popped up when the, uh, when the covered bridges that were here were um, finally needed to be replaced. Many of the bridges got replaced with these iron truss bridges. Um, wonderful image there, it gives you a good sense. Well, it, it actually, that bridge, uh, a little foreshadowing of the final thing. But while we're showing pictures, here's another great picture. This was also from a, a stereoscope. It has a black man, I believe, Knoller. Could just be bad light, we can't really say. Oh, it looks black in that picture, huh? Um, there were a, a significant enough numbers of black men who worked, and women, um, there was a, a Jane Shepos, Shepmos, a, a, a cook, who, um, who got injured because she didn't get down under the bridge quick enough. Um, one of the top captains one season had moved more tons of coal than anybody was uh, Tony Gallagher. And, and, and as the newspaper account said, colored. Um, the only way I'd know that it was a person of color. It was a job that they didn't pay well enough. It was a job that black Americans, newly free black Americans, could make a good living. We also have a great story of a captain who would supply an all-black crew for $33 a month. The white guy wanted $40 a month, a significant savings. And he was working for a man whose name will escape me. He was the, uh, he was the sheriff down in, in Accord. And uh, he owned some boats and hired people to run them. There's some more beautiful ironwork from the period. You just don't see buildings this historically intact in this day and age. They're really few and far between. This is a real historic gem that we're really proud to have it. <coughs> Here's another little favorite piece of iron work I'd love to show people. I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. This would have been 1827 now, folks, but it's this dead ball. Look at that. I, I ain't going anywhere. Getting on 200 years old. 193. Look, I can do math in my head still. Boy, that's... So now we're going to come out here for a minute, and you're going to see all new construction. This is the historic North Edition. We just replaced it. Uh, in fact, it was a year ago that I, uh, a year ago this weekend, that me and volunteers carefully demoed the old building that was here. In fact, what was here was something Mr. Novi had built. But it was based on, and we looked at historic pictures. I have a picture from 1863. The canal company had built this little entranceway, and now that doorway to nowhere gets blocked off. But what I really want to show you, you just saw that picture of the bridge. This stonework in here, look at how beautiful that stonework is right there. That's actually nicer than the other side. And the reason why is that early on you saw that stonework until the canal company built this building on top of it. But this was a, a retaining wall from the dirt ramp that went up to the stone um, support or abutment for the bridge that went right, right over the canal right here. So this is a bit of history in and of itself. And, and this became a separate entrance to the Chefs on Fire, uh, the basement restaurant that Mr. Novi had, uh, had started here. But here we've got then, here we've got the front door from the Mr. Novi's era. And yep, look at that. You know, the time goes so quick. I'm on the radio too uh, once a month. Boy, half hour. Seems like it goes by in no time. I think this might be a good point to thank you all for visiting with me today. To tell you, I don't know what I'll do next Sunday, but I'll think of something. Please keep watching our Where Is Our Historian videos. I love them myself, and I'm hoping you will, will as well. Um, I'm working on the virtual tour of our current museum. 
so it will have a digital memory of what that museum was like once we dismantle it and, uh, and probably sell the building. But uh, it's always great to get and see you folks and talk DNH history every Sunday. Nice to see friends and make new friends. Uh, please like us on Facebook, uh, like us on Instagram, uh, and YouTube, yes, and, and please subscribe. My wife is having to, to you know, give me little signals and stuff. So thank you very much. Great to see you, and I'll see you all again soon.